Hi, welcome to the Best of the Oprah Show. When Dr. Phil was a regular on our show, our viewers couldn't get enough of him. We were flooded with letters and emails from people begging for his advice on everything under the sun, from sex to weight loss to banning boys' night out. So here he is fielding your questions in one of the Ask Dr. Phil shows, pulling it out of the vault. You know what day it is. Dr. Phil is here. He's definitely all wound up and ready for action. If you have a question, just ask, and he's going to tell you how he sees it. Now, it might hurt your feelings a little bit, <laughs> but... But? I I'm not trying to hurt anybody's feelings, but if you don't want to know the answer, don't ask the question. Don't ask you. You know, if you want to hear what you want to hear, go talk to your mother. She'll tell you. That's right. <laughs> oh, it's fine. Oh, it's fine. OK, you can be sure he's going to tell you straight up. That's why we like you. Well, good. We're going to get the straight up truth. We have lots of people ready for the challenge. Now, I don't know if you all know this. When we do Dr. Phil's shows, everybody writes into us. We don't go around soliciting people, because we know whatever Phil says, he has said it to you, and you ask for it, right? Right. OK. Yeah, we're just not picking on people on the bus. <laughs> hey, stand we're up. We're picking on people who ask to be picked on. OK. <clears throat> they want to ask Dr. Phil his opinion, and they say that they are strong enough to take it, Phil. God, I'm starting to feel guilty here. No, no, no. <laughs> OK, first up, Carol and Winston. Let's have a seat. They have been married four years, <clears throat> and she says that her husband's sex drive is driving her Crazy, Phil. Uh, sometimes he wants it three times a day. In one day? <laughs> yes. In one day. <laughs> and forgets about four play, I just did, one or two plays. I just want to know what the... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <Okay. clears throat> I, I just want to know what the boy's eating. <laughs> you know? <laughs> three, three times a day, three I don't understand that. OK, she says uh, even when she gives in, he never seems to get enough. So let's look at what's going on in their house, OK? All right. My husband wants sex on demand. When Winston wants sex, he wants it now without any thought as to my needs or feelings. Come on. Winston's a wonderful man. He's very involved in church, and he's got a big, big heart. But when he comes home late at night, he turns into a whole different person. I'm already in bed, I'm all tired, and he'll just reach right for the cookie jar. His idea of coming on to me is, are you ready for me, baby? I have been known to skip the hors d'oeuvres and go straight for the main course. Winston would love to have sex three times a day. At this point in our marriage, we're probably doing good to have sex about three times a week. He always wants more. When we were in what I call the real honeymoon stage of our marriage, I was a happy camper. We enjoyed lovemaking three times, four times a day. I do believe that I'm just like most men in America today. Do I think I'm getting enough? No. Do my buddies think they're getting enough? Heck no. If we haven't had sex for three days, in Winston's mind, it might as well have been a month. Sometimes he can be a little forceful and won't take no for an answer. He will get a little hostile, a little angry, she refers to me as the Neanderthal. She also calls me the beast of the boudoir. I am sometimes demanding. I am sometimes aggressive. But we're talking about the woman that I love, a beautiful woman. He frequently treats me with disrespect, as if I were a possession or a thing. I would like to be able to learn how to set boundaries with my husband and to be able to get past the hurt and the anger and to turn this horse around. Now, interestingly enough, you said one of the things you said that jumped out at me in there is, this is the woman I love. OK, now, I'm just curious how this is working out for you. Uh, you're saying you get angry, you get resentful, you get hostile, uh, you, you get just real difficult to deal with. Now, tell me uh, the loving part of that. Let me maybe set the stage a little bit better here. Well, wait, wait a minute. I don't need a Fourth of July speech. Just, to, <laughs> just no, really. Just answer my question. What part of anger, hostile, hammering her, and and, and getting really upset? Uh, tell me what part of that is loving. Actually, that is not. I'll be the first to admit it. But the way I see it, Phil, 
I am blessed with a beautiful wife. I love her dearly. We have wonderful chemistry together. We have since our very first kiss. I am a red-blooded American man. So when you add the love and the chemistry and the passion together, of course. You know, I have a drive, but it's only for her. And I do admit that I need to work on my approach well, and be a little, less, a little less demanding. <clears throat> it's interesting that everything you just said, everything you just said was all about you. You said, I'm all excited about her, I'm passionate about her, I'm in love with her, she's beautiful, I'm a red-blooded American man. All that was about you. I didn't hear you say one single thing about her experience in the relationship. That's true. So, and, and I'm asking you, how's that working for you? Not as well. As Gee, you think? <laughs> Let's let, how is it working for him? How do you feel towards him when he's doing this? Um, when he's pushy and over demanding like that without considering my needs and feelings, I do feel hurt. I do feel frustration. I do feel more like a possession than someone who is loved and cherished. How does that affect you? What do you hear her saying? I need to listen better. I need to show more respect for her feelings. I need to show more concern for her. I need to work on my approach, be a little more romantic and my timing. You can't be romantic enough for her to want to have sex three times a day, <laughs> okay? <laughs> no, I mean, really, really. You know, there's, there's red-blooded American... God bless you, Phil, God bless you. There's, there's red-blooded American maleness, and then there's like sexual addiction kind of, kind of behavior. And those are two real different things. And I'm telling you, you can't be romantic enough. You couldn't, if, you couldn't be Tom Cruise and Brad Pitt with a beard and want her to do that, and, and her want to do that three times a day. So that means there's got to be some compromise going on here. You know, you say you need to be a little better. So you obviously feel rejected <clears throat> if the answer is no. You feel, you take that personally. There are times where I do get a little upset about it, yeah. yeah. I do. But I have to say, being realistic, considering we have children and careers and all of our church work and volunteer work, I'm getting much more realistic. What are the church people going to think when they see this? <laughs> wait, wait a minute. So this is Tuesday. Y'all going to church Sunday. Yeah. You're just going to walk in there and you're just going to sit down after having this discussion on national television. We're regular people, too. Okay. Very right, but, good. But listen, in, in all seriousness, you, you got to hear this. If, if what you're saying is, I really do want to have sex three times a day, then you're, you're trying to meet some need with the wrong thing. You know, it's kind of like when you have a craving for something sugary, nothing salty will do. If you want something salty, nothing sweet will do. And, and you're trying to fill some need with something that just doesn't hit the spot. And you say, I need to be, uh, I need to be better in my approach. I'll tell you what you need. You need to get a life. You need to get a dog. You need to get a hobby. No, you need to get another hobby, okay? You, you, you need to do something that fills you up other than wanting to have sex with her three times a day because she eventually will run you smooth off. Well, you know what? I actually do have lots of activities to keep me busy. Get some I, more. I, I, I... <laughs> Point. I think what we're forgetting here, I want to make sure this point is driven home real strong, is that I truly love and adore that time with my wife. It, she does too. It's not like, am I a barbarian every day, every night of the week? No, but there are times that I am. And that's why we're here. We would not come on Bill this show. Bill says, tell me what you want. What do you yeah. want? I want more, le more respect, more consideration for my needs and feelings, and um, a little more of a, uh, a setting the stage. Setting the stage. What like happens specifically outside that means what? of the bedroom before we get to, to That's that absolutely point. true. And if you love her, take care of what she needs instead of taking care of what you need because you're doing it out of love. Yes. When he gains weight, she gets turned off. Should their marriage fall apart over 20 pounds? you asking me. This wife wants to ask Dr. Phil how to overlook the fat. We'll be right back. So you're asking Dr. Phil today, and of course, he's doing what he always does, telling it like it is. Carolyn and Michael are having a battle over the bulge, his bulge. 
which I'm trying to see, actually. <laughs> uh, stand up, because I'm trying to figure out what she's talking about. I hide it well. OK. OK. <laughs> and he lost 15 since the show. Yeah, I've lost 15. And he lost 15. OK. She says her husband's gut is grossing her out. <laughs> stand up again. <laughs> OK. Turn around, Turn the people want to see. <laughs> There's some people watching right now that you want to see a gut? Put your, <laughs> right. Put your belly up to the set. There's some people are bellying up to the set right now to show you a gut. OK, he says he's tired of living with the food police. Let's take a look at this. Michael and I have been married six years, and he steadily has gained weight. He's 6'3", he's about 225 pounds, and um, I've always been petite. My wife, Carolyn, has been attached to my weight for as long as I can remember. This is not Michael who I married. He was a large guy, but he wasn't overweight to me. I gained 30 pounds after we got married. When Michael's at a point where he's gaining weight, I feel like we're growing apart. I feel like we're on two different um, paths. You finally were able to admit that you were eating a donut every day? Two. Right. Two donuts a day. So that's what dis that's like disgusting to me. Our relationship has become an extra 20 pounds. I see him getting dressed in the morning to see a big gut. It's just a turn off. I can't get past it. She'll ask me, what am I eating? Because my belly's gotten so large. And I'll lie, say nothing, and then I'll go to work pick up a honey bun and eat it. It'll make me feel bad, but it doesn't make me feel bad enough to stop. The weight, it affects how I feel about him, our intimacy, me trusting him. I'm on a new fitness plan, and I've lost 13 pounds so far. So I feel if I slip up now, she's going to be all over me and very upset. I don't have patience, and I don't have compassion for his weight gain. We've had several serious talks about my weight. And it's come up that if I don't lose so many pounds, that our relationship may not continue. I want Dr. Phil to get to the root of why my wife is so obsessed with my weight. My question is, how can I get past Michael's weight being a condition for my affection and love for him? <laughs> oh. OK. OK, OK. All right, all right. No, wait, come here, come here. No, Let just me just you. Say Michael's a doctor no, and no, says he knows you. that this is unhealthy. Okay, now, uh, honestly, <laughs> I, I'm curious. We just put you on the meat block up here. Um, tell me what his good parts are. What do you like about him? I love Michael, and when we married, we um, we we committed to living in truth and to being honest with one another and um, to just to grow together. Do you consider yourself to be a fairly intelligent woman? Yes. And fairly reasonable? Mm-hmm. Well, it, and I understand that you're concerned about this, but how do you honestly feel when she's dogging on you about gaining a few pounds? I, I feel terrible. I mean, obviously, it's, uh, it's been our biggest problem since we're married. Really? How yeah. long have you been married? How long? Going on six years. Six years. Wow. Okay. okay, you've been married six years. And I guess the thing I want to ask you as I stand here, and do you like have a day job and all? Yeah. What do you do? I'm a doctor. You're, you're a doctor. So you, what kind of doctor? A uh, hospitalist. Yeah. Uh -huh. a general internist. I only work in the hospital. Okay, so you're an internist. Yes. A physician. Yes. So you understand all of the, the logic of yeah. it. But does it, does it, does it seem unfair to you that she is judging you in this way? Unfair. Well, I know what she wants, and I haven't done it. So See, this is, this, is, this is what amazes me. <laughs> this is what amazes me. <laughs> Go figure. What are, what are you thinking? <laughs> Let me tell you something. The thing that gets me is you do strike me as an intelligent woman. I'm just wondering when you decided that you were so perfect that you deserve. I'm serious. When, when did you decide? When did you decide?
decide that you were so perfect that you even deserved a zero defect mate? I mean, what, what makes you think that you have the right to judge him for gaining a few pounds? And what are you doing buying into it, you idiot? What are you thinking? That's crazy. I mean, really, what, how did you decide okay, that? I, I can't stand looking when his gut gets big. He was 30 pounds over. To well, me, that's know, a lie. I understand what you just said. And you know it's what I can't and stand? And I don't like the lies. You know what I can't stand? I can't stand an angry, hostile, bitter person sitting there judging a guy that's a decent human being. <laughs> that's, that, is, that is way more offensive. To, that is way more offensive to me than what the boy weighs. I mean, okay, you're sitting there. Bill, let's cut to the bottom, Ch the, the chase, the bottom of the chase, where <laughs> he wants to know why she can't, and she wants to also know why this is such a block for her. No, she doesn't. Yes, That's I what she do. said. No, you don't. You want him to change. You want him to conform to what you want to do, and as soon as he does, you'll find something else. <laughs> now, you know that's true. And I'll bet you that's been true all of your life. You expect perfection from yourself and everyone else, correct? Mm -hmm. And if it wasn't that, it would be the what? Oh, my God, what if he started losing his hair? <laughs> I'm, I'm serious. You don't, want, you, you don't want to get past this. You want him to conform, do you not? Isn't it true that you want him to lose the weight and do what he promised you he would do to begin with? Yeah. Yeah. yeah well, I... Can you honestly look me in the eye and tell me that what you want to do is get where you can accept him being what you consider grossly overweight? Is that your goal, where you, get, you want me to help you get where you can accept that? Being overweight? Yes. I, I guess I want him to um, be I just want him to be honest with me. So we, well, do you know what, what part I mean? Like, why does he have to lie? And, like, if he's gained, if I don't say anything and then he's... He has to lie because children well, lie like, to their parents when they think they're going to get in trouble. I don't want to be that. I don't, my intention is not to shame him. But you have a parent-child relationship here. He right. is, this is a physician. This is a physician sneaking donuts out of Tom's thumb. <laughs> but, but you don't want that because you know what happens when you have a parent-child relationship? Children rebel. And when he does, he's gone, and then you're not going to be looking at that ridiculous stomach. And you don't want that. We have to break. Is that what they're telling us? No, I'm just standing up to hear the rest of it. <laughs> <laughs> no, but and I I'll... guess I'm afraid. What if uh, he just continues? Like, what if he's 31 and he's 30? He was 30. But did you? But did you hear what, what he told you? Did you hear what you, you said? You wanted yeah, to know what I, the reason I is. I don't. I need perfection. Yeah. That, that is true, correct? That. Yeah. That is true. I heard that. Okay. And did you get your question answered? I'm trying yes. to make you... What, is yes. your, what was your question? How I she can deal with her obsession with my weight. Well, it, it's all about her. It doesn't have a damn thing to do with you. <laughs> I'm serious. It is. It's all about her. It has nothing to do with you. It doesn't matter what you weigh or don't weigh. It's all about her. It has nothing yeah, to do with because you. Because the point is, when he loses the weight, there's going to be something else. There will be something else. And, that's, and you got to get tired of that. I mean, you really do. I know perfectionists wear themselves out. They just can't ever get things in line enough. They just can't ever get things right enough, and it absolutely wears you out. But give yourself a break. This doesn't have anything to do with you. Nothing, zip, zero. It's all about your perception. And the only one that can control that is you. Got to go to break. Next, she's been in love with a married man for two decades. <laughs> Oh, how long should she put her life on hold for him? I can't wait for Phil's answer to that question when we get back. Yes. Good. That was good. That was good. Okay, we love this. It's Ask Dr. Phil Day, so anything can happen. We heard from a lot of women who are in love with a married man. Mary says she's been having an affair with a married man half her life, and it's tearing her apart. Mary is on the phone. <clears throat> what is your question, Mary, to Dr. Phil? Dr. Phil, I've been in love with a married man for two decades. He says he's very unhappy but always makes excuses about why he can't leave his wife. I'm now 40. I feel frozen in a fantasy. Half of me knows this is a dead end, but the other half feels he's my soulmate. How long should I put my life on hold for the married man I love? 
Hold on, let's all take a breath, Mary, before this answer comes. Okay, go ahead. Mary, Mary, Mary. <laughs> Are you telling me you've been involved with this guy since you were 20 years old? 22. For 20 years, your entire adult life, you've been sitting waiting for this guy? Yes. Because he says he wants to marry you? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> where, where are you on the Easter Bunny? <laughs> Seriously, do you, what, do you disbelieve what somebody tells you? Not normally. I, like I said, I understand that it's a dead end, but the guy captured my heart when I was 21, 22. Well, he must have captured your brain also. <laughs> <clears throat> I'm serious. You, you said this guy is your soulmate? Is that what you said? I feel that, yes. Well, let me, let me clear that up for you. He's not your soulmate. And let me tell you how I know that. A soulmate is not someone who will set you on the sidelines like a secondhand rose, watch your entire life just absolutely wither away, and, and, and let you do that. Nobody would, that cares about you would even allow you to do that, let alone entice you to do that. What, what, what we know about this soulmate of yours so far is we know that he will lie, he is deceptive, and he will waste your life for his own convenience. That's what we know about him so far. And oh, by the way, let me add something else. Relationships that are born out of affairs survive less than 5% of the time. Okay, so if you had this miraculous breaking free on his part and you two got together, you're going to feel really bad real soon because you're going to wind up getting dumped. I had a woman ask me this question. I'm being nice to you. I, <laughs> I had a woman ask me this question in a, in a workshop recently that had been doing this for seven years, and I told her she couldn't get any dumber if we cut her head off. Okay? You've been doing it for 20 years. This is not good. And, and you're saying, I, I, I don't know what to do. What you need to do is break this off right now today. And you say, well, <clears throat> that will hurt me. You can say, well, that will hurt me and I don't want to do that. You're just afraid of what's on the other side. But let me tell you, it can't be worse than what's on this side. If you love him, you know what? Start grieving. You'll get over it but meet somebody that's willing to make you first class instead of back row, okay? Thanks. Good. No. I'm still on you couldn't be any dumber if you cut your head off. Okay. Well, come on. Okay, this next Ask Dr. Phil comes from a baffled bride-to-be. This is Michelle and her future groom, Alex, who are getting married in a year, and they're already at war with his parents over their wedding. This happens a lot, you know. It does. Okay, take a look. Dear Dr. Phil, my fiance and I are engaged to be married in an outdoor ceremony at a lighthouse by the foot of the sea. His parents have informed us that they do not approve of the wedding because they are Catholic and I refuse to be married in the Catholic Church. My future father-in-law has said he'd rather kill himself than attend a devil wedding. My fiancé is torn between me and his parents. I can't believe they've threatened not to attend our wedding. Please help. This is supposed to be a happy time, not religious warfare. What should we do? Sincerely, Michelle. Wow. Okay. So are you committed you're not going to do the Catholic wedding? Yes. We have an agreement between us that we're not going to do the Catholic and wedding. And you're at peace with that? Yes. You, you two as a couple are at peace with that? Yes. yes. 100% then you just need to call your dad and say, boy, we are going to miss you. True. I'm serious. Because I'll, I'll promise you, this is your life. It's your wedding. It's your decision. Now, I don't want every Catholic in America writing me a letter. I don't discuss politics or religion. Right. Okay, because that's a lose-lose situation. I, I, I believe in tolerance and, and respect for everyone's religion. This is your life, and you need to make this decision. 
And I can guarantee you, if you cave now on this, you'll be caving the rest of your life. Just think what's going to happen when you have children and you start getting into the christening or the baptism or how that's going to happen. I'm not saying those are evil people, but they're out of line here. This is your life, and you need to grab it and do it. Absolutely. Got it. Next, she says her boyfriend makes mean comments about her breasts, her skin, her hair, and he says she's being too sensitive. What will Dr. Phil say? We'll find out next on national television. Back in a moment. Dr. Phil's Mail is like the world's greatest soap opera. We love reading it. I mean, really, you want to really entertain yourself, go to your mail bins. The next question comes from a woman wondering if she should stay in her relationship. Tanya is her name, and she's sick of the degrading comments from her boyfriend. Oh, baby. Bill, uh, he says the problem is she can't take a joke. Let's see. Bill and I live together. We have a 15-month-old daughter, and we're thinking about getting married. I love him but he's always hurting my feelings with his comments and his jokes. I'm just a happy-go-lucky guy, but she's just too sensitive. He picks on me about my looks. Ever since I had my baby, my breasts aren't as perky as they used to be. He made the joke that I should have two midgets walking around with me to hold them up. And he thought that was really, really funny, but it made me feel very, very unattractive. Yes, I said that about her breasts, but I was just teasing. I mean, home is where you should be able to let your hair down. I think she just needs to lighten up. One night we were watching TV, and there was a fair complexion black lady on television, and he made the comment that I should bleach my skin to look like her. I just wish she wouldn't take everything so seriously. They're just jokes. One day I dyed my hair red, and my girlfriend came over. Her hair was also red. And he turned to my girlfriend and said, your hair looks great. I don't know what Tanya's trying to do. It was very degrading. She's too uptight. It's really frustrating because I feel like I'm walking on thin ice. I want Dr. Field to tell me if I'm being too sensitive. Should I know that he loves me and that the hurtful jokes are all in fun? No, wait a minute. I told Phil to turn to look at the sister girl chorus over here. They're like, oh, no, oh. Anyway, Phil, go for it. So you think she just needs to lighten up. So how much do you weigh? <laughs> 200. I think I'm getting a bad rap here. We talk about each other. And it's like, I don't know when she takes it to that next level, when she makes it serious. You don't know when it's going to hurt and when it's not? I mean, is right. that what you're saying? Right, because we go back and forth. I mean, yeah. she's got nicknames for me, too. <laughs> so how do you feel when he says things like you've mentioned on the tape? How does that make you feel inside? It makes me feel like I'm not good enough. No matter what I do, it's not going to be perfect. It's not going to be great. Or that, or really just that he doesn't think that it's great. Have you told him that? Yes. Do you hear that? Yeah, and I tell her it's great. I mean, that's, that's the whole point of joking like that, to let her know that it is great and we can have that open relationship. Nothing serious. I mean, I don't mean anything that I say. Well, wait but, a minute. Excuse well, me. <laughs> <clears throat> Excuse me. I don't know. Phil might not know, even know about the light skin, dark skin thing. I don't know, because, no, he doesn't. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> Nobody takes a joke, the bleaching the skin thing. You know that. That is not funny to none of us at all, ever, is it? No. no. <laughs> it just isn't. I don't know what's funny about that. The, the reason it came about, because it just happened to be a light-skinned person on the TV at the time. We were watching television. <clears throat> uh-huh. And, and, well, and ask her how all. funny does she think that is. Well, I mean, I get the light-skinned jokes, too. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, do I say that's not funny? Uh, it where, isn't where, funny. Where do we draw the line? It's not funny for you, well, and it's not funny for her. Right, let, so let me answer your question. Let, let me answer your question. You said, where do we draw the line? Yeah. Because my sense in talking to you is that you're not an evil and vicious person that's trying to hurt her. I mean, I, I, I really don't get that uh, kind of cold arrogance from you. Uh, I just think you got some really bad judgment, okay? So, I mean, I, I really don't think you're trying to 
to hurt her or be, be mean-spirited. But you said, where do you draw the line? Yeah. You draw the line when you look and see what the effect of your humor is. Because a joke can get real expensive if she goes back into her room feeling bad about who she is. There ain't nothing that funny. But see, that's, that's the point about it. We laugh about it at that time, and then three days later, that's when it comes. You up. ever see people that laugh sometimes to keep from crying? <laughs> they laugh Man. out of anxiety. They laugh out of pain. I don't think she's holding her ribs and falling in the floor because she thinks you're Richard Pryor. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> you, just, you, you just you you got to ask you've got to ask yourself honestly what is the expense. Of, of this joke here. And, and what she's telling you is that when you're talking about things she can't change, it's not funny. She doesn't like it. it tell me, what, why does it bother you that he talks about breasts that, by the way, droop because she had your child? <laughs> okay. <laughs> How do you. Tell me how you feel when you walk away from that and you're, you're not there anymore and you walk away. I want to know what your internal dialogue is. What are you saying to yourself? Well, first, I'm stunned because I don't... You're right, I don't know whether or not... I, I think maybe there's something wrong with me because I don't think it's funny. And I'm like, maybe I, maybe I should think it's funny, but I know it's not. I know it's not. So it, that's, that's what makes it hurt because it's coming from someone that I love, and no one likes negative. What about that part in the book, and like, I think it's one of the books, Relationship Rescue, where you said a relationship works to the degree that it meets the needs of... The two people yeah, involved. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and the quality of a relationship is a function of how well it meets the needs of the two people involved, and, and your needs aren't getting met. And I'll just say, final comment, I hear people here talking about love, I don't know how y'all define that, but you know, love is caring, giving, sensitivity, acceptance, protection. It's not just a, some kind of lusty feeling. It's a lot of other things that you have to put into it as well. Think about that next time you make a joke at her expense. Next, he won't propose. How long should she wait? Dr. Phil, on when to give up on getting the ring. Back in a moment. Dear Dr. Phil, I have been dating Doug for over three years now, and I am tired of waiting for a marriage proposal. He is 34, with no kids, he's never been married, in fact, I am the first woman he's even lived with. Talk about a marriage-phobic freak. He's mentioned marriage, but, um, where's the ring? They say if you push for marriage, it causes resentment in the man, but if you devote three years to a relationship and he is still getting the milk without buying the cow, it causes resentment in the woman. Am I wasting my time? How long do I have to date before he'll pop the question? Tired of waiting, Lisa Pierce. Okay. So, three years, huh? Are, and you haven't ever mentioned marriage to her? We talked about it. Uh huh. <laughs> about like that'd be good for other people or what? I mean... <laughs> well, I, I, we talk about a future together. Um... I mean, uh, as far as being married someday. Yeah, you're just not much into it right now. It's just not a priority with you right now. I guess not. <laughs> and, and, you know, and that's absolutely okay. I, I mean, that's absolutely okay. If you don't want to get married, there's no reason that you should get married. But I want to answer your question, uh, Lisa, real straight up. And yeah, I, I'm just a country boy. I don't always understand all the nuances involved in this stuff, so I just always kind of look at results, you know? I, there's all these theories and dynamics. I just look at things based on results. Based on, <laughs> based on results, you're not tired of this, or you'd, you wouldn't still be there. Right. Okay? Based on results, he does not want to marry you. Then why did he talk about it? <clears throat> based on results, he doesn't have to marry you. He's getting everything that he could possibly want in the relationship right now, true? Very true. I mean, you, you guys live together? Right. Do you, you do stuff around the house? 
We share money, we share bills, yeah. we share the house. So he's got him a partner, and you're all living together. You have a sexual relationship. Yep. Works for Doug. <laughs> <laughs> But, but I mean, basically. I don't know if you all can see it on your TV. Doug has turned four shades of. Uh, I think that is now the color of crimson there on your face, Doug. It's I mean, okay. really, we teach people how to treat us. And you've taught him, you don't need to marry me. I'll give you everything you want without the paperwork. You're right. Okay, and, and, and you said, how long should I wait? No more. If that's what you want. If that's what you want. If that's what you want. If you want to get married, then you need to say the price of poker here is getting married. Okay, and if you don't want to do that, if it, if it doesn't matter to you, then fine. Be happy the way you are. But if you want to get married, three years is a long time to wait. In fact, you, there, the, the research is real clear on this. Long engagements do not predict good marriages. And I think one of the reasons why is if it takes you that damn long to make up your mind, <laughs> then th there were some real reasons for it. Absolutely. Right. You always see some Doug, you're blushing so hard. Did you want to say something? So you, when you did, did you want to say something? Because I don't want you to get home saying that darn Dr. Phil didn't give me a chance. Is there something you want to say? Oh, I do love her. I love her very much. Yeah, but you don't want to get married, do you? No, I, it's not that I don't want to get married to her. I love her very much. I, I you know, we we've made a commitment to each other already. I mean, as far as being together. I'm I mean, not trying to get you to marry because I'm oh, not I know, the girl no. to talk to you about that. <laughs> but, <laughs> But I just don't agree with, I, well, you know, I don't agree with Dr. Phil saying leave him. <laughs> I mean. No, I'm, I'm not saying leave you. I'm saying if what you want is to get married right now and he doesn't want to, then you've answered your own question. There's no reason you should marry her if you don't want to. And there's no reason you should wait three more years if you do want to get married. Right. Okay, R Dean's going to break his wrist. We got to go. I'm not saying you should leave him or you should marry her. Earlier we heard from Michelle, whose relationship with her future in-laws is a bit strained. Well, at one time, Nancy Nickerson could relate to that. Take a look at her story. Keith's mother, Laverne, was not pleased that he was interested in a used woman. She was very angry that I had been married before. Shortly after we met, we became engaged. We wanted the wedding fairly quickly. And Laverne just was positive I must be in the family way and that that was the only reason why he would want to marry me. Laverne did her best to point out my flaws and character defects, especially in a room full of people. <laughs> she liked to introduce me to her friends as, this is my youngest son's second wife. Oh, I would be steaming. Being in the middle between my Nancy and, and my mother was, would, would be difficult because I love them both. And uh, I felt that if I loved them both, they could love each other. Over time, I began to understand her dislike for me. She had a loving daughter relationship with Keith's ex-wife, Linda, and it didn't leave much room for me. I took an interest in her, and then she took an interest in me. I think it helped create the bond. She started to see me not as a daughter-in-law, but possibly as a friend. That's when things really began to change. She found out she had breast cancer eight years before she died. It was only after her husband's death that she decided she didn't want to fight it anymore. And she had asked me to help her die. And so I said I would. In her final year, we became best friends. I took care of her every day uh, as she was dying. It was um, a very peaceful, and beautiful passing. We were all there, and um, we were holding hands. And it was nice. When I saw Mom and Nancy become best friends and become true kindred spirits, it takes away the negative energy of the day. It makes your life so much brighter. My mother-in-law taught me many things. She taught me not to take life too seriously. She taught me how to make the best rye bread in the county. She taught me how to forgive those um, that have hurt me in the past. She was a great person for sharing forgiveness and saying, oh, it's no matter. When I hear of other people sharing their stories of how 
hard it is to get along with their in-laws or that there's grandchildren that they haven't seen. It makes me sad because time is such a precious thing. Laverne taught me that, that each day is so worth living. Every day you get a new opportunity to renew your spirit and to renew a relationship, mend a fence, say I'm sorry, it isn't that hard to do. Find the joy in life. I want to say thanks to all my guests and Dr. Phil, of course. Thanks, everybody. Thank, Thank you. God. Thank you.